invite you now to turn with me into the scriptures. We're in Exodus chapter 20 this morning, reading verses 1 through 11. Then God gave the people all these instructions. I am the Lord your God, who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. You must not have any other God but me. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in, in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. You must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not let, let you go unpunished if you misuse his name. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for, ordinary, for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female slaves, your livestock, and any foreigners living among you. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them, but on the seventh day, he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. Love it if... Uh, we could pray together before we dig into God's Word. So if you would, please pray with me. God, we do thank you for your Word. We thank you that your Word is alive and active. We thank you that, Lord, by your Word and the power of your Holy Spirit, you transform our lives. And we ask, Lord, that right now at this moment you would speak to us, you would speak into our lives, and, Lord, that as you do that, that you would give us the faith to respond because, Lord, we want to be those who build our lives not on sinking sand but on the rock who is Christ, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. So uh, this morning we're continuing our series uh, called Wilderness Training as we're continuing to, uh, our, our way through the journey through the Bible, reading together through Exodus. And, and what we've seen is God has freed the people of Israel. He has saved them from their slavery in Egypt, and God has been leading them toward the promised land. There's a, a place, a land that God had promised for the people that they could go and settle, and they would become uh, his people there, and they would become a light to the nations there. And, and here's the thing, uh, God keeps his promises, right? God always is faithful to his word. God keeps his promises. But, um, you know, the struggle we have a lot of times is um, with the timing, right? Um, okay, we got the promise of God, and guess when we want it? Um, I know I'm picking on Becky a lot, but it's like, you know, there's like six of us here, so, <laughs> so you know, this is us, right? Um, okay, so when do we want it? We want it now, right? We want God's promise. We want it now. Um, and so a lot of times we have a hard time waiting on God's timing. As a matter of fact, I was thinking about this. Um, do you know, uh, patience is actually a fruit of the Spirit. That's what the Scripture says. And what that says to me is that if a human being is patient, <laughs> it is a work of God right? It is a legitimate miracle. Uh, it is a work of God in somebody's life. So with that being said, one of the things that we've talked about is that the Israelites, if God had led them directly to the promised land, it would have taken them, you know, somewhere around two weeks and they would have been there. But God knows that they're actually, they're not ready. They're not ready to take the direct route. They, they are not ready to face the challenges that they're going to face. They're not ready to be the people that God wants them to to be. And so God is going to take them the long way through the desert, through the wilderness. And it's during that time in the wilderness, that time in, in this place that, yeah, is not difficult. It is, it, is not a, it is not an easy place to be. God's going to shape them and form them. You know, the thing that we find about the wilderness, about these times of difficulty and trial in our lives, is that they are a time when we are, we are seeking the face of God with a greater frequency and a greater intensity than we do in times when it's really just easy. And so, um, as we're in this time that we could kind of call our own sort of wilderness, right, 
we've been seeking God's face. We've been saying to God, God, how is it that you want to shape us and form us now? How do you want to teach us so that we, we can be a people of faith, that you could shape us and form us as a people of faith so that we could be a people who are people after your own heart, God? And today, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're looking into um, the first section, the first section of the Ten Commandments. And what we're seeing here is instruction in these first few commandments, these first four, uh, instruction on how we love God, on what that looks like, on how we can love God, how we can guard, and that's really important, how we can guard our love for God. How do we guard our love for God? And, um, and I think, you know, context here is really important. Um, context is really important because, listen, you know, this is not just some kind of um, impersonal legalism here. Think about the context when these Ten Commandments are given. So God's already saved the people, right? They're already saved. He didn't give them the Ten Commandments and say, hey, if you guys get after these ten, then I'll come around and save you. That's not what happened. God had already saved them before he gives this, these commandments. And not only that, God had already invited them into a special relationship with him. We talked about that last week, that God invites them to be his own special treasure, his royal priesthood, his holy people. God's already invited them to be in this special relationship with him. And they said yes. So they've been saved, they've been invited into this relationship, and here comes the Ten Commandments. So it's not God saying, hey, if you'll do these, I'll think about having a relationship with you. No, no. God says, I want this relationship with you. And now here are these ten words, these ten instructions that will enable you to continue to live in this relationship. They will be guardrails to you to keep you from running into the ditch. You are in freedom now. You have life now, and these will keep you from running yourself back into slavery. This will enable you to continue to live what is truly life in God. So, um, so we turn then uh, to the scriptures and see that, that the first four here, it's real interesting, um, that the first four are about, really about loving God, right? Last six, about loving people. And that starts to sound really familiar, right? First four, loving God. Last, four, last six, loving God people. And I, and I want to point out to you here the great unity of the Scriptures. This, this is, I think, is so important to see, the great unity of the Scriptures, uh, and, and to consider how that came about. When you think about all of the different biblical authors, right, writing literally over centuries in different places, and how all of it just hangs together with this amazing unity. And, and I think, and I think, you know, lots of folks who, who are into the Scriptures, um, I think they feel the same way that, that the most amazing thing about the unity of the Scriptures is the unity between the Old Testament and the New Testament in Jesus, right? You, you look at the unity of this and you think, there's no way just as, as, as an ordinary work of literature written by this many people over this period of time in this many places could actually hang together like this, but it all, it all points to Jesus. So, the Old Testament is pointing forward to Jesus, the promise of the coming of the Messiah. The New Testament is pointing back to the Old Testament to show Jesus is the fulfillment of that promise, and it's also pointing forward to promises to come to the culmination of the promises of God that is entirely consistent with the Old Testament promises right there is a unity there's a trajectory to the scriptures and I and I share all of this because as we're thinking about the law I think it is so important for us to know that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law that it was pointing forward to him and he says that he came to fulfill it not to abolish it so how is that so all right so Jesus he gets asked this question really good question actually what's the greatest commandment out of all the 613 commands in the Old Testament, which one? Like, help us, help us do some prioritizing, Jesus. This is what he says in Matthew 22, 37. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commands. And so Jesus here is quoting from Deuteronomy 6 and Leviticus 19, and he's saying the whole of the law and prophets, that is all of the Old Testament, really are an exposition on these two commands. That it's all about living these two principles. This is actually the heart of what the redeemed people of the Lord look like. 
This is what it looks like to be a person after God's own heart. This is the heart of the law. But here's the other reality I think we shouldn't miss as we're getting started into this is that the heart of the law, right? The heart of the law points to the heart of the gospel because the reality is, the reality is the only reason we are not condemned by this law is because of the grace of Jesus Christ. It's only by His grace that we are not condemned by this list of commandments. Con condemned by the law. And actually, actually, it is only by His grace that we have any hope of being the new creation, of being who God created us to be, to actually be transformed into this people of faith, into this people who love God and love people genuinely as they love God themselves. This is a work that God does from beginning to end. This is not our accomplishment. This is by the grace of Jesus Christ. This is what he wants to do in our hearts. And so with that in mind and with willing hearts, let's look then at the specifics. What is it that God is showing us here in these first four commands about loving God, what that looks like, and especially how we guard, how we guard that love for God. And first thing, first of all, we're looking at how to love God, to guard that love is to let God be God. To let God be God. So God begins the instructions, right? This is not actually preamble. This is not just introduction. This is the beginning of the instruction. This is key to the whole thing. He says, I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. This is the Lord declaring who He is and showing, this is who I am and this is how you've experienced me. This is what I've done. I have worked in the world. I've done work in your life. I have saved you. This is who I am. And then, <laughs> and then God does this incredible thing. I mean, to me, this is incredible. He says, this is what I did for you, right? You remember this. And then immediately, He goes in to first of all saying, you know what? You are not to have any other gods. Then he says, you know what? Don't make any idols. No idols. Don't form anything and bow down to it. Don't do that. No other gods. No idols. Don't bow down to them. And that's an incredible... Think about this, okay? <laughs> all that they have been through. All that God has done for them. God, by signs and wonders, by His mighty right hand, freed them from slavery in Egypt. Especially I'm thinking about how the angel of judgment passed over their houses because of the sacrifice of the Lamb. By the way, pointing to Jesus. Consider how the Lord led them out of Egypt, how He parted the Red Sea so that they could go through on dry ground. And He, he actually saved them again there from the Egyptians, then from the army. And think about how God has provided for them. He's provided manna in the morning, quail in the evening. God has provided water for them in the desert, water from this rock. The rock that we learn later in 1 Corinthians is the rock who's Christ. And I'm thinking, okay, after all that, pillar of cloud, pillar of fire, parting the sea, quail, manna, water, all of that, I'm thinking, why in the world has he got to tell them not to have any other gods? Why would their hearts not always be his after that? Why would they not have this permanent, fixed devotion to the Lord after that? And of course, somebody could ask us the same question. We who have been redeemed at such a great price by Jesus Christ, why would it ever be an issue? Why would you not have a permanent, unalterable, unwavering devotion to Jesus Christ? But you see, God knows our hearts better than we know our own selves. He knows how we're broken by sin. He knows how our love for Him, how our devotion to Him is under threat, how it is in danger. To let God be God is to allow God to put up these guardrails that keep us from running off the road because of this human tendency, and here it is, this human tendency to want to make God after our own image, to want to make God like we want God to be rather than allowing God to be God Himself. Do you know, um, atheists, one of their uh, accusations about, uh, about believers is that God is just this projection, right? A projection of human need, of human aspirations, of, of human's desire for hope, of human fears, that God is just this uh, made-up thing, this projection in the sky. And you know, 
in a way, they're actually not wrong because this is often what we want to do. Rather than bowing down to the one true and living God, we would rather make God after our own image rather than be re remade in His. And we can see this, listen, we can see this in our culture because here's, here's what's happened. There, there has been, and everybody recognizes this, everybody sees this, there's been a great wave of secularization in Western culture, right? We got it. That's, a, that's just a real thing. It swept across Europe. It started to affect our country in some real ways. There's been this wave of secularization, and yet that wave of secularization actually cannot erase the, the human being's desire, our desire for God, our need for God, our longing for God. And so, instead of just saying, this is all ridiculous, don't do any of it, religion actually becomes a sort of utilitarian thing. You know, if you need that, if that's helpful to you, then you can have it. You can do that. But here's what you want to do, right? Recognize that there is no absolute truth in religion. There's not, right? And so you can just sort of, you can just sort of pick a religion that suits you. Pick one that works, that works for you, right? Pick one that works for you. It's utilitarian. It is not based on an absolute truth of who God is. The way this gets expressed a lot is people will say, I am spiritual but not religious. People will say, I'm not into organized religion. Translation, what that actually literally means, what that means is, you know what, I have a need for God. But I don't want anybody telling me what God's like. I want to be able to shape and form God as I want Him to be. I want to piece together thoughts and ideas and philosophies that work for me, that agree with what I think, that work for me, that, that meet my assumptions, and so I will not subscribe to any organized religion. But, but listen, this is not just outside of the church. This is not just outside in the culture. This is also in our hearts, and it is also, this tendency is also in our churches. We want God to agree with us. I mean, I do, <laughs> right? I want God to agree with me. We want God to agree. We want God to be like we want him to be. We want him to do the things we think he should do. We want to also shape and form God. And this is why we have to stay grounded in the Word of God. This is why we have to stay in the Scriptures, because it's in the Scriptures that God has given us instruction. He's made declaration. He's made a revelation. He has shown us who He is. He has said, I am the God who rescued the people of Israel from Egypt. I'm the God who did that. I am the God who promised the coming of a Messiah. I am the God who came in Jesus to seek and save the lost. I am the God who has provided a way to redemption, to restoration, to forgiveness on the cross of Jesus Christ. God declares, this is who I am. I am holy and righteous and just and merciful and faithful. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am. And God has shown us in His Word the life that is right and good. He has shown us the way of life in Jesus. And we don't get to change the Word of God. We don't. We don't get to shape and form God to suit us. We don't get to shape and form His Word to suit our ideas and longings. We love God by letting God be God. And second, second thing, and this is really closely related, that loving God means <laughs> letting God be God alone. Letting God be God alone. And so, you know, there's this temptation to make God into an idol, right? To shape and form God like we want God to be. But there's this other temptation to actually replace God, to find a substitute, so to make an idol to stand in, an idol as a rival to God. This is the temptation that we're going to guard against in this point. Now, listen, there's this, um, there's a sort of advantage in the wilderness, if you think about it. The advantage of focus and clarity. Because in the wilderness, when we're in those times of trial and challenge and difficulty, all of those things that we've tried to prop our lives up with, all of those things, well, they sort of prove unworkable, right? They start to fall away. You start to see that they're actually sinking sand. And so there's this advantage of clarity and of focus in the wilderness that we know our life is in God. We know that our hope is in Him and Him alone. 
Right? And so there's this great focus there. But what God knows is that when the people go into the promised land, when they go, they're going to be confronted with, they're going to have available to them all of these little G gods. And it's real interesting. If you kind of go through uh, the, the gods that were available in the promised land in that area, um, real interesting how this is kind of similar to today. Listen to this. So they had gods that represented money and prosperity like the Baals. There were gods of sexuality, like Asherah. There were gods that were about power and human strength, like Moloch and Asher and Marduk. And, and I think all those kind of sound familiar, right? Because it turns out the human heart has not really changed all that much. We are always, in our pride, looking for replacements for God so that we don't have to be dependent on God so that we can make our own way, so that we can be independent, and so thus we set up these rivals to God. You know, this is why Jesus, this is, this is why Jesus says, listen, you can't actually serve God in money. Like, that is not a thing that's possible. That's not a thing that, that can be done. You're going to love one and hate the other. It's just true. That's what's going to happen. You're going to be devoted to one and not the other. That's just what's going to happen. You will give your life for one, to having one and not to the other. And you see God's jealousy. We read about God's jealousy here. And, and listen, God's jealousy is not about pettiness and, and about control. All those things that we think about in human jealousy, it's not about that at all. God is a consuming fire and His, His jealousy is His love for us. It is His desire for us to have life and, and and to live in truth, that is the core, the heart of his jealousy. He doesn't want us to give our lives to these little G gods and to find our lives drained of their purpose, drained of the power, drained of the love of God, the joy that we have in him because we give our lives to something that's not him. And finally now, we see that we love God. We love God by letting God be God to me. So we let God be God, let God be God alone. And finally now, to let God be God to me. Do you know, um, it's really interesting to me, eight of the ten commandments are, are prohibitions, right? Don't do these things. Thou shalt not, right? They're guardrails, right? So eight out of the ten are guardrails. And then two are prescriptive. So don't do all these things. These are guardrails. Do these things, right? Not, the, not these, do these. Just two. And of those two, check this out, of those two, one of them is about doing something that's not doing something, <laughs> right? One of them's about observing a day that's about not doing anything. It's about the Sabbath rest. Isn't that interesting? It's almost like, it's almost like God's trying to show us that He's done all the work, that He's provided, and it's just up for us to not run it into the ditch, <laughs> He has made a way. He has provided it all. God says here, observe the Sabbath. Keep it holy. Rest on that day. And incidentally, um, anybody know, I'll give you a second to impress whoever you're watching this with, uh, what the other prescriptive uh, word from the Lord here is. Anybody remember? Just call it. I mean, come on, there's six of us. Somebody call it out. You remember? What's the, he tells us to do. Don't do, don't do, don't do. What is it to do? Anybody remember? Um, kids watching at home. Honor. You remember? Honor. Come on now. Uh, you got to be louder than that, everybody. Honor your father and mother, right? Okay, so, but anyway, back to the Sabbath, right? That's the other one. Isn't it interesting? The only real thing he says, do, do, do this. Make sure you do this. Honor your parents. Remember that, kids at home. Um, so, uh, let's think, though, about the Sabbath for just a minute. Let's think about the Sabbath for a minute. Um, why would God tell us that a part of loving Him, a part of loving Him is to set aside this day of rest? Why would that be? Why would that be to love God? Why would that be? And I would contend that ultimately this day of rest is about trusting in God. Is about trusting in Him. Think about the ancient world especially. But this is true in some places, obviously, still today. In the ancient world, um, much of life was about survival. It was about doing the things that you had to do day by day by day to survive. And then somebody tells you, yeah, yeah, okay, there's this one day 
you're not allowed to do any work. I mean, just imagine what that's like. How God is actually in this command saying, I'm asking you to trust me. I'm asking you to trust that while you're not working, I'm working for you. I need you to trust that while you're not working, I'm providing for you. This is about trusting in God. You know, and ultimately, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Ultimately, this is pointing to the gospel of Jesus Christ and how we rest in Him, how we rest in Him. And, and the question here, the Sabbath question for us is, as followers of Jesus on this side of the cross, the question for us is, from Jesus, will you trust that, that I've done everything necessary for your salvation? Will you trust that there is actually nothing that you need to add to what I have done for you to have God's favor? Will you actually trust that I died for your sins, not just for people in general, but specifically for your sins so that you might live, so that you can stand before God as though you were in perfect righteousness because in me, Christ would say, you are. You are in perfect righteousness as you put your faith in me. You know, there's this, this real interesting exchange in John chapter 6 between the crowd and Jesus, all right? So here's what happens. Um, Jesus feeds the 5,000, right? Feeds the 5,000, pretty cool thing. And they decide that they are going to like stalk Jesus all around the, the Sea of Galilee, right? The, they're trying to figure out. They're all plotting. Okay, where do you think he is now? Where is he now? No, he's not here. And then they finally catch up to him, and here's what Jesus says. I tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understood the, mir the miraculous signs. But don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man came to give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. They replied, we want to perform God's works too. What should we do? What should we do? Okay, good question. This is what Jesus says. Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. So Jesus says, listen, you guys are... Follow me all around the lake. You're spending all this energy because you think I'm going to give you some more bread. Some more fish. Well, what I'm telling you, Jesus says, don't spend your energy just on that perishable stuff. Instead, spend your energy. Make your work about getting the eternal life, the life that I came to give you. And they say, okay, that sounds good. We'll do that. Tell us then, Jesus, what does that look like? What is the work that I need to do to have this life that you came to give me? And what does he say? Think about this now. What does he say? The work that you need to do to receive this life is to trust in me. Think about that. Spend your energy. Have you ever thought about this? Spend your energy actively trusting in Jesus. Spend your energy, your focus, on putting your eyes on Jesus. Keeping your eyes on Jesus. Spend your energy bringing every situation in your life before Him. Give it to Him. Spend your energy trusting in Jesus, and then you will know the life that He came to give you. We will find that rest, that life in Him. May it be so in Jesus' name that we let God be God, that we let God be God alone, and that we, we let God be God to me. That is, that we put our personal trust in Jesus Christ, and we pray it in his name. Amen. Amen. And I'd, I'd love it if we could come before the Lord in prayer. Would you pray with me? God, um, we want to say thank you. Because we know that apart from your grace, apart from the cross of Jesus, that these commands condemn us. We could not fulfill them. We couldn't hope to. But we know, Jesus, that you came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And so we know that by your grace, we are forgiven and set free so that we can become, by your grace, by your power working in our lives, the people that you want us to be, a people of faith, a people after your own heart, a people who are being shaped and formed and restored into your image, Lord Jesus. 
And so we want to pray just one thing right now as we give you thanks and praise. We pray, Lord, that you would enable us, Lord, that you would give us, you would give us the energy, you would give us the trust to look to you, to look to you and rest in you. Enable us to do that work, that only work that is required to know the life that you came to give us. We pray for that in gratitude and in faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And to close our service, I'd, I'd like to share with you a scripture. Um, this is coming up in our journey through the Bible. We're, we'll be moving into the book of Ephesians. And we read there, and, and if you would receive this as a blessing from the Lord, in chapter 2 and verse 18, I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope He has given to those He called His holy people who are His rich and glorious inheritance. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Love you, church family. Hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.